I appreciate Thank the invitation. It turns out in 19, uh, May of 1991, I discovered how to uh, most uh, infuriate and frustrate uh, one's parents. I had a uh, business degree and I sat my parents down at the kitchen table and said, you know, I am going to produce independent films. And uh, that didn't go over well. I think they heard Dave's going to be living with us for 10 years. <laughs> and I then told them that I was going to do documentaries. And they, of course, thought Dave's never moving out. Um, so I embarked on this. And I decided I was going to be an independent film producer. And I worked hard and failed um, for a lot of reasons. In hindsight, probably because I had a lack of experience. And, and I'm not sure I had much talent for that. Um, but. I blamed it on another reason, and it was it, it led down a career and, and, and 18 years of dealing with technology that helps deliver content from studios to consumers. So at Sonic, we um, our mission statement is Hollywood to home. So we are in business to help studios get movies to your home, and we've done that through historically through disc. 95% um, of the world's DVDs are created with our software, and we help um, consumers play back that software. And we've, in the last four years, started working on you know, what we all think of as over the top or digital distribution. So it turns out in 90, in the early 90s, um, I'm doing documentaries and I run into these hurdles. The first hurdle is this gear is really expensive. Good cameras, editing equipment. Um, I'm freelancing in the evening doing Budweiser commercials to pay the bills. And we're all borrowing equipment and sneaking each other into each other's post houses at night to you know, try and get the next documentary out and um, calling up PBS trying to figure out how do we get distribution and I think this is insane. You know, there's, first off, I might not be the talented guy here. In fact, I'm sure I wasn't. But there are a lot of really smart, talented people who had good stories to tell who could not get those stories out. I mean, there was, in my mind, this technical barrier. Now, it turns out I'm wrong and it, there wasn't this golden era that was going to happen. I do, you're going to hear at the end of this, I think we are entering that stage. But, um, it was clear to me that there is these hurdles, a little bit distribution, but mostly, gee, if these, guys, if these talented people I know, these filmmakers had this gear, they could tell these wonderful stories and all these great stories that haven't been told would be told. You'd unleash this talent. And at around that time, I met the founders of Avid, who turned out to produce a successful company, EMC, maybe some of you remember, kind of a PC version of it. I see some shaking heads. Um, and a gentleman at, uh, had started a company called Sonic Solutions. Uh, Bob Doris, who uh, just le left as president of Lucasfilm and working on the Editroid, so a nonlinear editing system that was tape based. So I'm talking to Bob, and he's telling me how the world's going to change. And, and what, you know, a few years ago he'd done the Editroid, and this million dollar product is going to be $10,000 by, you know, 1994. And he told me a story about a demo that he gave. Uh, George Lucas brought in. Uh, Michael Jackson and Francis Ford Coppola, and he showed them this great new thing they built called the Editroid. Bob gave a demo, and you know you had these luminaries in the industry who were just fascinated by this new machine and how it would unleash their creativity, and they could find things quickly and go back and forth and you know do what we think of as nonlinear editing. And Bob was, you know, he said what, what they didn't, they failed to understand is that within a couple of years, this million-dollar thing is going to cost ten grand, and it's going to be even better, and that the amount of creativity that's unleashed. And I was fascinated by that vision, and I decided to embark with uh, Sonic and, and uh, help create tools that would be computer-based. So, so these big analog contraptions, we'd have these computer-based tools. Um, shortly after that conversation with Bob, he, uh, I was watching, uh, I still had the desire to do documentaries and was kind of in transition period. I was watching Heart of Darkness. You know, in that, there was this, it was it literally must have been three weeks after I had this discussion with Bob about the demo. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola talks about how you know, it's this elite group of people that can tell a story. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I know all these great, talented filmmakers, and they cannot find a way to make a living. And their parents are doing the same thing mine are, which is like, oh, you know, it's like you know, he's going to be an actor. It's worse than that. I mean, it's, he's going he's gonna to do this, go down this wrong path. And so, and the quote, and I wrote it down in the hotel room. So Francis Ford Coppola says in 90, well, he's, this was distributed in 91, so he says probably in somewhere in 88 or 9. To me, the great hope is that now with these little 8 millimeter video recorders and stuff, 
people who normally wouldn't make movies are going to be making them. And you know, suddenly someday, a fat girl in Ohio is going to be the new Mozart. And you know, make a beautiful film with her father's little camcorder. And I remember, like, that was a, such a, I mean, it still gives me shivers, honestly. Right now I've got shivers reading it. And I thought, you know, what an injustice. You've got this talent that cannot be unleashed because of tools. Now, but first off, I was wrong. There's, I, I'm going to tell you today, I think there's four pieces of the puzzle. Cheap tools, distribution, inexpensive distribution, I should say, marketing, and then consumers who know how to actually use that, that infrastructure. And um, one of the best, I'll steal this from another presentation I saw, it was talking about how the Gutenberg Press, you know, just changed society because it was this cheap tool. So it's the, it's the CMX edit bay that cost $20 million that is replaced by a $20,000, you know, camcorder and some Apple software. Um, so you've got the printing press, and, and prior to that, you had these books that were, you know, 100 pounds that were chained to the wall, and the Gutenberg Press suddenly creates this technology where you can have a book that you can hold in your hand. The technology is this thing that's cheap to distribute and you can read. It doesn't change, by the way, the fact that, that the, the books now are, are the same thing that was before, but it starts a process where people learn to read. So instead of 1% of the population reading, you have greater percent. Eventually, people create, and I think we're at that we're getting to that point where the creation exists. So you move into the 90s, I'm wrong. It turns out that cheap tools are not going to free up all this creativity, and suddenly this is a profession that isn't such a volatile, dangerous one that, that I think it still is today. So we get to 2000, and suddenly that's going to be the way that this creativity is unleashed. Everything is everywhere, and you'll stream movies to your PC, and it doesn't happen. Um, and for a lot of reasons. One, uh, the consumer still isn't trained. Most people by 2002 and three didn't have broadband, didn't know what a wireless network was. The idea that you'd play it back in your PC it was limited to your PC. More importantly, I think what most people fail to understand is to stream a movie today, when we stream through, we stream you know, millions of movies through a variety of different retailers and storefronts. So that's what Sonic does. Um, and you know, it's about five to ten cents to stream Harry Potter or Avatar to your Panasonic TV, your Sony TV, your Blu-ray player, you know, whatever, your iPad, and a high quality. That's, you know, for the most part, your average consumer sees as the equivalent of a DVD. You know, I think we all know it's a little bit lower, but it, it, it looks good and is acceptable. That's five to fifteen cents. Uh, in 2000, that was about five to six dollars. Seven years ago, it was five. For the, if you wanted to deliver that same amount of content, the cost of delivery was five to six dollars. I don't care if the entire population had broadband, understood how to use it, that model wasn't going to succeed. The plumbing wasn't going to be built. The internet turned out to be a really good way to reach the customer. So you need, the four, you need distribution, cheap tools, marketing, and an educated consumer. 2000 to 2005 gave us a cheap way to market and reach customers. Consumers understood that. They understood how to get you know, information. I mean, Blair Witch Project clearly demonstrated that, that you could reach the consumer through the internet. Still didn't solve the distribution problem. You still, if you're going to make money with Blair Rich, Blair Rich still had to go through traditional models. And so a hierarchy of a few media companies um, still really controlled your ability to access and get that stuff in the hands of people. There's a technical barrier. Um, and something magical happened about three years ago. About three years ago, and, and, as, and from a technologist perspective or a technology company, it was becoming clear, bandwidth is in place. People understood Wi-Fi. Uh, Chipsets, to, to put a chip that, on a TV that connects to your wireless network that used to cost, first off, was probably impossible in 2003, technically, went from 30 cents to, uh, I guess it was, you know, you'll hear 30 to 50 cents to put that chip in the TV right now. That was probably 30 to 80 dollars six years ago, if you could even do it. Um, so suddenly you go, wait a second, all the plumbing is in place to deliver high quality content. It costs five cents to deliver. Uh, two years ago it was 80 cents, now it's five cents. In a year it'll be less than a penny, right? So you're getting into the point where it's almost, it, you're getting close to push that movie to someone and stream high quality image isn't going to cost much at all, if not, you know, less than a penny. So we embarked on our mission statement, which is Hollywood to home. How do you get movies from, you know, we don't care if it's a chip or a disc or whatever, and we start to work on this. Uh, uh, building software for chips, clouds that feed it, tools that feed the cloud so that you can essentially build the plumbing for, for that movie. And a lot of companies see this and start to move down that path. I think the important thing is that you now have cheap distribution. So you have that third leg of the stool. 
Um, it can almost prop itself up. And if you look, if you ask people who are selling movies digitally, they'll tell you they're not making a whole lot of money digitally, at least. And I, I think we're, at Sonic, we, we're probably the second or third largest provider of movies on the web. Uh, Apple's clearly number one. And it's always hard to get rough data on this. And, and we do this through Blockbuster and Best Buy and Dell and HP and Warner Direct and a bunch of folks. So they're facing brand using our platform and rights. Um, but, but you can see there's clearly more margin. The negotiations are different. It's an independent producer talking to you know, a Best Buy rep because they're now the distribution channel. And I, I, I'm going to tell you that I believe in the next two to four years there'll be a wholesale shift to the biases independent content. The consumer has to understand how to use it. And it, you know, it's got to be simple. I've tried to explain streaming to my parents. I'm the son who does something in computers. And you know, what's meant, what it would mean to you know, watch a movie through a TV or a Blu-ray player. And uh, they just, and they're smart people. They just couldn't get it. And now I can tell you, they, they are watching things on their phone, their, no, not their phone, their iPad at least. They've got an $80 Blu-ray player that streams content, they're telling their friend. The consumer is being trained. Now, on the backs, by the way, of Hollywood studios and cable companies and all the other people that are, you know, they're not, they're not watching, you know, Susan's Bottle Shop, right? They are watching um, new movies and new feature films in the first window. But the reality is there's nothing, there's no ownership of that pipe. That cloud, that chip, that device isn't owned by a cable company, it's not owned by a studio, and, it's, and it's, it is a free plumbing and channel that exists that um, I don't know how the business models work, I don't know what they look like in the future for future films and for independent producers. The amount of creativity that will be unleashed and the businesses that will exist for independent film, it will bias that person and that individual. It'll, the same way a book is. I mean, books are not written by corporations. You know, every great novel I can even think of was an independent producer. And it was somebody, now they may have used various channels, but J.K. Rowling's and, you know, pick your book, whatever your favorite book is, I guarantee you that person wasn't working for a conglomerate and a bunch of people in a room and they said, hey, Joe, go write a book and we'll fund it. That's, that is the world we're entering. And what the business model is, I don't know, but it is, a, um, I'm convinced that, that those four pieces are in place for marketing, distribution, it's cheap, and an educated consumer. Um, I'll, I'll leave you finally with the, the you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful in the next two to four years we see this, it'll all explode and there's going to be interesting creative talent and people that will, novels that will be written in the form of films. Um, and that, you know, that, that little girl in Ohio is going to tell her parents that I'm going to make feature films and that's going to sound like just as secure a position as a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. And so, I, thanks for your time at the conference. I, I'm uh, looking forward to watching the rest of the, the presentations and I'll be living vicariously through all of you uh, as you make your movies, and, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you.